discovery of antibiotics transformed our world. Previously incurable diseases are treatable. Medical procedures can be performed safely. Millions of lives have been saved and their well-being radically improved. Our time with these drugs is running out. Antibiotics have been used so much, many infections are once more untreatable. Drug-resistant infections are already responsible for nearly 1.3 million deaths a year. Without urgent action, this number is projected to increase exponentially. Drug-resistant bacteria know no borders. Everyone is at risk, everywhere. Your family, your neighbors, your colleagues. We can prevent a post-antibiotic era by taking action now, together with urgency. GARPI is a non-profit organization accelerating the research and development of life-saving treatments for drug-resistant infections for every person who needs them to protect our health now and for generations to come. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I think that works. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, very good to see you to this uh, first session of the day uh, on the topic of uh, global partnerships uh, on, in the AMR research sector. Might sound a bit like a niche topic at first, but you have uh, already seen that uh, AMR is one of the biggest global health threats uh, we are facing. Uh, and my name is Laura Jung. I'm an infectious disease clinician and AMR researcher at the Leipzig University Medical Center here in Germany. I'm very happy to uh, guide you through this session this morning. Um, as most of you probably know, AMR is very closely linked to a lot of other topics that we have discussed uh, here at World Health Summit in the past um, days already. Recent research uh, published in The Lancet estimated that in 2019 alone, 1.27 million deaths were directly attributable to AMR and uh, a lot more would be associated with the resistance. So um, those numbers often sound very abstract. Um, they don't mean a lot to a lot of people, but um, as a clinician, I can tell you that those numbers are not abstract and they're also not like the future to us. They are really our presence, like it's our daily struggle. And resistance is hugely driven by the social and environmental determinants around us. So maybe one short example to also connect our session to the other sessions that are going on um, here, mainly the ones on, on, for example, conflict and migration. Um, right now in, in the hospital, the most resistant infections that we are seeing are people that come from Ukraine that got wounded in battles, treated in field hospitals, and then at some point made it um, to Germany or to Central Europe. And it's very devastating and very concerning as a clinician when you get back those lab results and you go through your list, you have like one antibiotic with like a big capital R and the next and the next, and you really end up having very little options and very, like you end up very empty handed um, in front of your patients. And that is something that could um, could really affect all of us, like all of us in this room at some point in our life. So I think it's um, important that we meet here together and um, and discuss how we can move forward um, with those issues. Um, for us as clinician also, it's sometimes a bit frustrating because we look like left and right to like our colleagues who are oncologists or cardiologists that have like new drugs on the market each year. Um, whereas on the antibiotic pipeline, there is a bit of a stagnation, uh, nicely framed. Um, and especially there is not a new, uh, not a lot of new drugs coming out that have a lot of innovation, a lot of like uh, different mechanisms on how they work. So um, you can also imagine that if that is my situation here in like a German tertiary care center, 
uh, it's even worse in many parts of the world. And we know that the burden of AMR is the highest, well, not in Europe, not in the US, but like in Sub-Saharan Africa, where there is also a huge access component when it comes to antimicrobials. Um, so I'm very happy to be in the position today talking with the, those fantastic experts here from the other side of the pipeline, if you want, um, and explore a bit the question of like, what's the matter with the antibiotics and um, how can we move forward? Um, you're going to see that the antimicrobial market is a bit of a challenging one. And um, I have to say that as clinicians, we are also contributing because while we are calling for the new drugs, once they are out, we really don't want to use them and keep them on the shelf for emergencies. So I understand that for the pharmaceutical industry, it's not uh, very attractive. Uh, but that also um, means for us that we can't rely on just market mechanisms to move forward with uh, bringing new antimicrobials to the market and most importantly also to the patients. Um, and um, that means that in the antimicrobial research and development sector, a very interesting ecosystem has been developed um, with a lot of different structures and partnerships. And we thought it would be really interesting to uh, dive a bit deeper into those partnerships and to see how they can help us to move forward and uh, yeah, maybe bring the innovation and bring the drugs to the market. So um, we're now going to first introduce uh, this amazing panel to you. And uh, they are going to explain you a bit what they are doing, where they are coming from, and um, how the partnerships they have are already impacting the work they are doing. We're going to start with the easiest one, the organization that I assume by now all of you are going to know. That's the World Health Organization. Uh, and we <laughs> We have Valeria Gigante with us, uh, who works for the AMR division on research and priority setting. So uh, Valeria, over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here today. I'm honored. So we have seen that drug-resistant infection kills today more than HIV and malaria, but these deaths are still preventable. AMR is a global crisis, and only through innovative and holistic solution, strengthening the partnership, the collaboration that already permeates all our efforts, we can try to outsmart the fast evolution uh, of microbes. W2 is providing leadership to tackle AMR, working closely with our 194 member states, with donor, patients, multilateral organization, trying to promote a global convergence to address unmet public health needs following a one health approach. And the goal is to ensure access to existing and novel antibiotics and to preserve their effectiveness over time, delivering integrating a healthcare solution with therapeutics, vaccine, and diagnostics. Within this framework, the framework of the Global Action Plan that WHO developed in 2015, we provide research coordination and priority setting to guide R&D and investment, but also public health intervention. And I'm very pleased to announce that on 25th of October, we will launch the first fungal priority pathogen list that was developed in collaboration with Sydney University and a large consortium of experts coming from all over the world. And next year, we will uh, revise, we will launch the bacterial priority pathogen list in collaboration with the Verona uh, University. And this work will be fed with the data from the global uh, the burden of disease study, thanks to the collaboration with the IHME. Um, and all our work, all our efforts are really done in a collegial efforts involving experts from different disciplines uh, coming from different regions and also accounting for gender, for gender balance. And I guess the identified priorities, we also assess the size of the pipeline. Last May, we published the annual antibacterial pipeline report. And last July, the first bacterial vaccine pipeline report. And we do it also in collaboration with the accelerators and all our experts. 
what we found, we found that size matters and the size of the antibacterial pipeline is still insufficient to address the magnitude of the threats. And we have seen the number of candidates declining over time. We had 31 candidates in 2017 and we have 27 candidates today. Innovation is crucial to overcome existing and emerging mechanism of drug resistance, but clinical innovation is still scarce. Six out of 27 candidates in a pipeline against the bacterial priority pathogens uh, are the products that can be considered innovative. And if we look at the, uh, at the products authorized in the last 10 years, over the 80% of them, so 10 out of 12, are evolution of existing class with already established mechanism of drug resistance. And if we look at the bacterial pipeline and uh, the bacterial vaccine pipeline analysis, six bacterial pathogens are responsible for um, most of the AMR uh, deaths. Only one of these six is Streptococcus pneumonia as a vaccine authorized. So the R&D of antimicrobials is a complex is a complex issue. Nobody can do this alone. But if you're serious about it and we invest today to, to address this emerging global crisis, we can have an impact and save the lives of the most vulnerable population, children, elderly, pregnant women that are disproportionately more affected by drug resistant infection. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria, and uh, also thank you for the work guiding a lot of the research uh, priority setting. Um, next up, we have uh, Manika Balazagram, who from the uh, he's the executive director of Guard P. That uh, you had already a short introduction in the first uh, video, and uh, yeah, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll probably just uh, give a very very quick introduction to Guard P, and then talk a little bit about partnerships. Uh, so GARDP was an organization that was um, actually launched in 2016 um, by the WHO and, and the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. And we became uh, a legal entity in about 2019. So we've we've been probably legally in existence for about three years. Um, our focus is very much on late stage clinical development and early access. And what we try to do is really take a global health dimension. How can we accelerate and bring these antimicrobial treatments um, to patients. And I think we, um, taking the global health dimension, we really try to look at this uh, on, on a few different dimensions, one of which um, Valeria had mentioned. So starting with WHO priority pathogen list, we are really focusing on gram-negative infections, but we try to go on another dimension of that, which is looking at what specific infection types uh, where we have major important gaps in, in treatment, uh, and emerging resistance, and also specific populations, notably uh, as an example of that, um, neonates and, and young children. And that's particularly where we're seeing a high burden of disease. Um, uh, we currently have a portfolio project. So um, at the moment now, there are probably kind of six what we call drug candidate um, potential treatments um, that are now in late stage development. So phase three and just uh, post registration. Uh, and that constitutes probably the bulk of the work that we're doing. Um, in terms of uh, how we work, we, we are a relatively small organization, and I would say for an R&D um, organization, a relatively small budget, certainly in comparison to the other product development partnerships. But what we have learned from them and others is that the way to really uh, optimize uh, our resources, but also work effectively uh, and actually look at more sustainable results is to work through partnerships. And I'd like to give you a little bit about, uh, of information about you know, how we think of, of partnerships, because there are several different elements involved. Even in one particular project, we may have a range of different partners. So obviously, um, you know, starting um, at the top, we were kind of uh, co-founded by WHO, and WHO remains one of our key partners, particularly in terms of the priority setting element. Um, so it was really through, um, I think, a lot of consultation with WHO that we, and using, I think, the pipeline report that we have carefully looked at and selected um, some of the candidates uh, in our current uh, clinical pipeline. We've also worked with the WHO Essential Medicines List to identify particular drugs of interest, but also talk to them about what they see as particular gaps in data that needs to be filled. 
Um, but WHO has also played an important role in actually pushing us to even open certain programmatic areas. So we currently work on um, serious bacterial infections, hospital-associated infections, but also have an, a children's antibiotic program that covers both pediatrics and neonates, but also um, sexually transmitted infections. And th that last one was a bit of a surprise for some people, but this actually came as a request from WHO to open this, this program. And we currently have a, a phase three program uh, uh, ongoing. But we also work very closely with WHO um, uh, member states. So the WHO actually, the, the real backbone of WHO are all the member states. Uh, and some of these member states have been extremely important in the in the inception and the creation and the financing of GARDP, and we really see them as our as our core partners. Germany, obviously, being one of one of our key key partners. There are also countries where which are heavily we are heavily involved in and working with um, to implement our programs. And to give you three examples, South Africa, India, and Thailand are all countries where we have very strong um, national level collaborations, including. MOUs with, with the ministries of health, but also research institutions like the Indian Council of Medical Research and the South African Medical Research Council. Um, then going beyond that, um, we really have to work very closely um, with industry. And industry is a key partner, but there are many different, uh, again, different faces of industry. This can include small companies. Uh, so we have um, partnerships with, with a couple of uh, biotech companies that uh, are on phase three development. Um, and these are actually not just funding agreements, but actually um, um, research and development partnerships and licensing partnerships. We also have a partnership with a, with a larger pharmaceutical company, so Shinogi. And, and this is a much more complex partnership related around uh, int early introduction and access. And of course, we shouldn't forget um, manufacturers, and that includes the generic companies. And we're also working with these companies to look at manufacturing and supply, which is a very important component of long-term access. Uh, and last but not least, I'll just give there's, an, there's another dimension of that at country level and on the ground level. And those are the clinical networks, uh, academic groups, but most of all, um, just yeah, um, uh, healthcare providers on the ground level. Uh, and they will be probably, they are the key partners that we work with now for many of our different projects, uh, particularly in certain areas like um, neonatal sepsis, where we work very closely with neonatal networks. And for instance, in South Africa, it was in close collaboration with some of our partners that we actually um, really saw one of the kind of spin outs of the work we were doing was the creation of a kind of strong neonatal network in South Africa to really improve patient patient care. Um, but this, but but these networks also will include going forward um, early adopter networks. So if we want to be looking at introduction of new or improved treatments, these networks are going to be absolutely key for early introduction, uh, but also uh, stewardship and use. So that's um, I'll stop there. But that's just to give a flavour that in in the work that we're doing, we're really building connections and interconnections between these different groups and in any given project that we're doing, we will have a constituency of all these different um, partners involved. And I think that that's been a very, very enriching uh, experience for us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Manika. And after uh, diving a bit into the light uh, research and development with Guard P, we're going to take it one step uh, back and I'm going to give it to Erin Duffy, who is uh, the Chief of Research and Development at uh, Guard Carb X. So a bit of the earlier stage, Erin. Thank you, Lauren. I'm really delighted to be here and, and be a part of this panel and, and the meeting in general. It's been a great meeting. Um, so my name is Erin Duffy, and I represent an organization called CARBEX, which stands for Combating Antimicrobial Resistant Bacteria Biopharmaceutical Accelerator. So that's the X part. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a mouthful. Um, so recognizing that, number one, resistance is a drumbeat that never stops. Number two, uh, that an innovative pipeline was lacking to face the ongoing resistance and um, what was number three? Um, well, it doesn't matter what number three was. Um, so there were a, a variety of, of factors that the U.S. government recognized they needed to do something as a matter of national health security. 
Subsequently, um, they conceived of a, 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 an accelerator called Carbex, and they were joined by the Wellcome Trust, the German government, the UK government, and the Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to create this entity. They chose our group, we're domiciled at Boston University in the School of Law, to be their implementing partner. Since 2016, we've been entrusted with around $870 million for this purpose, and the purpose is simple, to help innovators around the globe discover, optimize, and advance towards patients, treatments, preventatives, and diagnostics, all focused on bacterial infections, particularly those caused by drug-resistant bacteria. We do this through a non-dilutive funding mechanism, so there's you know, no equity or IP uh, stake in the company. Uh, but importantly, any one of the funders whom I mentioned could give money to these organizations, and that's not why we exist. We exist to fund them, but also to support them scientifically uh, and from a business perspective. You might um, be surprised to know that uh, the great majority of, of companies in our portfolio, and to date we've supported 92 individual groups, the great majority of those are about five to 10 full-time equivalents. Um, these are usually scientists that are excellent at the foundational technology, um, but really not good drug discoverers and certainly not developers. And so, um, one of the partnerships that we've created is, is really a federation of experienced pharmaceutical scientists um, who you know, have a little gray hair because they certainly had been around for many years. Um, and they, with us, form support teams around these companies. They typically represent both the breadth and the depth of experience that is needed to bring these programs forward. We focus on the earlier stages, so what's called hit to lead, for instance, uh, the earliest stage of translation of interesting new innovation through to a demonstration of safety in humans. And so certainly we rely on upstream partners, and those are typically national governments who fund uh, academic and, and early innovative research uh, in startups. Um, and on the other side, we certainly are reliant on groups like Guard P, um, which Monica uh, explained um, earlier, as well as pharmaceutical companies. And you're going to hear from my colleague to the left from Johnson & Johnson, but also organizations like BARDA in the U.S., like HERA that is forming uh, in the EU, uh, something called the AMR Action Fund that was founded largely by um, big pharmaceutical companies and foundations to be that next implementing partner to bring products through uh, advanced development and onto the market. So we rely on all of these groups to take the innovations that we support and make them uh, real for patients who need them. Our priorities are set largely by uh, the pipeline that uh, that uh, WHO and, and the CDC in the U.S. as well uh, define, and also through a federation of practicing clinicians and pharmacologists who guide us on where the highest unmet need uh, is and where we should go, and importantly, also performance characteristics that are necessary uh, for patients. We do finally uh, just emphasize we do take a global approach, uh, and that again is to ask the question, what is relevant for these products in both high and low middle income countries? And uh, we ensure that these products will have access through a stewardship and access program that we commence when these programs uh, arrive at the clinic. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, you already pointed to the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Martin Fitchett, the Global Head of Global Public Health in Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Martin, my initial statement, I said that the big pharma companies are more or less pulling out. Is Johnson & Johnson pulling out or going in? Not pulling out. <laughs> We're going in uh, head first. And uh, so firstly, uh, thank you so much, Laura. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. And um, Firstly, I wanted to say what a remarkable illustration of, of the emerging network that this panel provides. And, I, and I'll talk a little bit about how I feel we can fit in. I think the topic is, is AMR partnerships. Uh, to, to have an understanding of how we became really interested in AMR, Johnson Johnson, uh, 
we go back to probably back 20 years when we began development in TB, new TB drugs uh, in our infectious diseases and vaccines therapeutic area. We launched the first new TB drug, Bidacolin, in 2012 for 40 years. And it's, it's actually now 75% of all MDR oral regimens, um, are highly effective. And, and what that told us is firstly the importance of AMR, but that also underpinned us creating a unit in Johnson Johnson, which I now lead, called Global Public Health. And Global Public Health brings together all our, uh, our pharmaceuticals and medical technologies that we develop specifically uh, in R&D, along with access uh, and last mile programmatic uh, 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 programs uh, for low and middle income countries. So it's unique in industry that it's lab to last mile, as we call it. We have an R&D organization that innovates directly against high burden disease. And actually the, the, the success of the approval of Bidacolin let us develop a whole TB portfolio. We have an HIV portfolio, neglected tropical diseases, Ebola vaccine, COVID vaccine. We have a, a dengue fever, short, a small molecule phase two, et cetera. So this is the, the, the organization that allows us really to continue to innovate, not just against AMR, but specifically against AMR risks in low middle income. Um, which brings me to think about the question of, of TB. Um, and I'm hoping Valeria, when the list comes out that MDR or TB will make it to the priority pathogen list. We know it kills one third of all AMR deaths. Uh, it's, it's a huge burden of disease and only one in three are diagnosed. And for all two of three of those who are undiagnosed, they can infect up to 15 people per year each with resistant strain. So I, I hope it makes it. I'm not sure, I know probably we can't talk about that so much, but I think it's really important. I think for, for the world that, that not only MDRTB is on the list because it's such a massive burden, but it also globalizes the issue and it brings in a, a very high burden uh, 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 resistant bacterium, particularly problematic to low middle income countries into the list. And, and I think that's gonna be uh, important. What about partnerships? So when we think about partnerships, our model in public health in J&J is, is innovation at the core. So what can we do uniquely to the incredibly complex problems uh, uh, in low middle income countries. And probably one of the highest impact things we can do is invent new drugs and develop them and get them to market uh, and new technologies. Uh, so how do we partner then to make those have impact and, and to really get to the patients they need them? Uh, we know that in AMR, for example, there are probably three main aspects to, to the problem. The first is prevention, preventing, uh, inappropriate use and, and, and resistant strains developing in the first place. The second is stewardship. Um, the third is innovation. And I would say we fit probably in the innovation part of the puzzle. Uh, and it's uh, probably the late, uh, as I say, we can, in, we can work on innovation probably in two ways. And this is how we do it in J&J. &J. Firstly is directly innovate. So we have a very active pipeline in TB still, um, preclinical. We're also engaged in the, the Gates Pan TB collaboration which is phase two onwards, which is with Bidacolin in the backbone. And of course, we're still actively working with Bidacolin, ensuring we get maximal access worldwide. Uh, then there is perhaps a more indirect, and that's why j, &J was a founding member of the AMR Action Fund, which Aaron uh, referred to. Now, this, this is actually the largest public-private partnership uh, in AMR. Uh, with over a billion dollars in management, uh, pharma companies came together with Wellcome, EIB, and philanthropists to form this fund remarkably quickly, actually. We're about two years old. And the objective is quite simple, is to, be, to bring between two and four novel differentiated antibiotics to the market, to the global market by 2030. And I'm, I'm, I kind of play a, a really, uh, a, a, a role I play, like to play on the board is also to, to keep us focused also on this as a global problem. And, and it's focused on, on high income, medium and low income. And all the companies the, that, that will be funded uh, by this fund will be encouraged, indeed, asked to provide and develop access plans for low middle income countries as well. So that's the, the action fund. Um, one of the other things which I think is also really important is to create an environment that will stimulate investment in R&D uh, for the whole world. And one of the things about AMR, which I think is really important, it's, it's actually like COVID, isn't it? Like, to use Dr. Tedros's expression, nobody's safe until everybody's safe. It's exactly the same for AMR. So we've got to think about stimulating investment in pipelines for all markets.
because investment, uh, a, a, a conducive market, meaning a mar there, there could be market incentives, it's not an incentivized market right now. We have 20 to 30 antibiotics in development, 1,300 anti-oncology drugs, right? To give you an example for what is a health security emergency. So how do we incentivize companies to invest in infectious disease pipelines? That, that innovation will lift all boats. And then we solve the problem working with GuardP and others and how to maintain and ensure we get access and equity of access at the same time of those technologies as they could be launched worldwide. So that's how I see industry playing a role. Thank you. So and then uh, last but not least, I'm introducing uh, Ralph Sudprak. He's the lead of the global AMR R&D hub that is based here in Berlin. And uh, he's the one who has a bit of the oversight of all the projects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. And thank you also, Peter, for organizing this session and inviting us to the panel here. Um, AMR, antimicrobial resistant, is complicated. So it's complicated. Uh, we have an issue with the communication. I think antimicrobial resistant is complicated scientifically. AMR is complicated economically, I think. But I think it's worth uh, all the effort. And why is it? Because antibiotics are fantastic. That is the best um, drug classes um, mankind had had ever. So if you have an infection, even a deadly infection, you take uh, this drug, this antibiotic, and you are cured within a week. So you, you are healthy. That is a difference to most of the other diseases where you probably only, um, with a, a successful therapy, uh, you can expand your lifespan only by a bit. So that is, and antibiotics are not only fighting infections. Antibiotics are the, really the foundation of modern medicine. Without antibiotics, there's no um, routine surgery possible, like we know it in the moment, like uh, cesarean sections, like, like hip replacement, like uh, organ transplantations, like like can cancer treatment. Uh, um, and so what we have to do, uh, yeah, and we are losing the, the antibiotics. So that is our problem. We're losing them because of resistance, Pat pathogens develop resistance. And so what we can do is uh, what Martin really said, we have, we have three three options. Um, we have to do all of them. So we have to prevent disease. We have to prevent infection. For this, we need, uh, in addition to all other uh, behavioral changes, we, we need vaccines. And then there are um, the uh, prudent use of antimicrobials. For this, we need really uh, diagnostics. And um, then, uh, last but not least, but mo most importantly, we need new un uh, antimicrobials. We need a, a working pipeline. And um, for this, this, we need really research and development and in investment and smart investment in research and development. And here, the global AMR and D uh, hub comes into play. So we are really enhancing coordination and uh, improving collaboration on a policy level by um, making recommendations on gaps and opportunities in AMR, R&D. Um, so we are working, uh, one, one example is uh, the G, we are a G20 initiated uh, global partnership uh, uh, consisting of 20, 20 board of members from all over the world, including uh, the European Commission and uh, the two foundations, Bill and Melinda Gates and Welcome Trust. And we have, have all the observers on our board, all, all three of the four, uh, quite apartheid organizations, including uh, WHO. And we have a fantastic stakeholder group uh, with uh, Guard P and Cup X are members of these. Uh, so we had just had our board meeting and we provided a table really for and uh, providing a partnership of partnerships, if you want, or a network of networks. And that is really important that people come together and talk together, uh, like here on the panel, the, that they are, they are on different stages uh, in the development of these drugs and that they can have a platform to to talk and give us also advice of how we can go go forward. Um, 
So we are working also very closely on what I said on the policy level. We're working together with the G7. We are working together with the G20. So the, during the Osaka Declaration in 2019, the global leaders from the G20 called on us to do an analysis on what is ha happening in the pool and push uh, incentive side. And since then, we are working on different reports. Uh, and these reports really cumulated in a report we submitted this uh, year uh, to the health minister, this report was done together with Peter Bayer from WHO, the former WHO, now Guard P. Uh, uh, and this report was really a requested report, which was presented by Peter uh, face to face to the health ministers and also submitted to the finance ministers. And that is really important. That's also the finance ministers got this report and they even called on us to do another report for next year to in 2023. And now we are reaching out to the J Japanese G7 delegation and also to the Indian G20 delegation, they uh, Lav Agarwal, who represents India on the G20 uh, health community, was present at our board meeting virtually only, but he committed already that uh, AMR will be a, a, a priority. And what we learned yesterday in the G7, G20 uh, health policy uh, uh, session here at the World Health, Health Summit. So there's a good, we have a good hope that also the uh, AMR will be a priority of uh, the um, Japanese G7 presidency next year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's really great to have all those people from different stages uh, in the research and development process together on uh, on one panel. I think we have heard we have enough evidence. We know we are facing a really big problem. We have a lot of G7, G20 awareness from the governments. Um, we have a lot of partnerships already, but so far I still end up with like a lot less new drugs than my my colleagues from oncology. So my question is, what else do we need? Um, more partnerships, more money, more time. Do we have the time? And um, or maybe more patient advocacy. I worked very well in the HIV AIDS uh, uh, movement. What are the the factors that we that we need? What do we else do we have to overcome to bring the drugs uh, to to the patients? Um, I'm maybe playing it directly back to to you, Ralph, before we go uh, in more depth with the others, uh, because you also have this great dashboard. I, I'm not sure you even mentioned it. You have a great online dashboard where we can get a great overview of, of everything we have. So when you look at this dashboard, where do you see the gaps? Yeah, thank you very much. So I no time in this for, 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 for five minutes to uh, mention everything what we are doing. So we have a dashboard where we are collecting all the data worldwide, what is invested in, in AMR R and D since 2017. And we also uh, are showing there um, all in organizations and initiatives uh, who are active in the field of market incentives. So we have a couple of uh, galleries there. So uh, what we see is... Um, First of all, I think we are on a good way. We've made a lot of progress, even in the last year, what, what we received with the AMR Action Fund is, uh, and uh, the second round financing of Cup, uh, CapEx. And uh, we will hear later on the announcement, which was already published, I think, yesterday, so it's not a secret anymore. Um, so we we have really a lot of pro progress. And we are, uh, and to develop a drug that takes 10 years, and I think that we have the... Uh, window of uh, opportunity is probably open since probably six, seven years. So we have still uh, time, time in front of us. Um, but what we are seeing is really that, that the developing the value chain is really thin and very, very, very fragile. So if you, for example, see the preclinical pre uh, space, in the moment, Cup X is the lonely kid there. There's not, no one else. So I'm, I stopped last year. So we don't know what's happened with uh, IHI, so the Innovative Health Initiative. The, the Repair Impact Fund is waiting probably for a market incentive. They pause with, uh, with, with the financing. That is, is, so we have to be clear that this is very federal. So if one of you, uh, one of the partnerships collapse, the, uh, uh, do not get funding anymore, the whole system will collapse, and that's, we, we have to make sure that this, all of the of the players has to be financed. Probably the last thing is because also Cancer Scholz says this, 
very important is the basic research feeding or, uh, or the uh, innovation pipeline. And um, probably we have to think about how we finance basic and very early drug discovery so that we probably need more top-down um, funding uh, addressing really the priority pathogens which are identified by CDC and the WHO. I guess I'll follow on from that. I mean, I think what, what we've seen is that there is a lot of innovation in that early area, and it's a question of how we channel that and guide that through to product development. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like the state of that is good. It's then how we pull it through. Um, but I, I think, you know, another thing is, sure, financing is always important, but money doesn't solve everything. And, you know, one of the things that we should take away from this meeting and also last year when we gathered here is that there are so many opportunities for us in the not rear view mirror of COVID, because I think we're, you know, wherever we are in the mirror of COVID, um, to learn about efficiencies. So how do we how do we capitalize on those clinical trial designs that really expedited our vaccines through uh, to to get them, you know, to all of us who needed them? Uh, another area, certainly, and, and again, we do focus not only on treatment and prevention, but also diagnosis. And I want to say a couple of things about that. That's really critical. If you think about a lot of the um, bacteria on the priority list, you know, these are, are bacteria for which we don't have solutions. People would love to have a, a narrow focus, laser focus product for, for instance, Acinetobacter bomani. How are you going to do that clinical trial if you don't have a diagnostic? You know, you're going to wait and wait and wait for these people to show up. Um, and, and that's a real challenge. So having diagnostics is important. And here's another area where we can take advantage of what we've learned in COVID. So think about the two, I mean, there are many players, but um, think about the company Cepheid uh, and the company BioMiriu um, with BioFire. Their installed bases around the world are massive, couple orders of magnitude greater than they were before COVID. So you have these bases. Let's take advantage of them. Let's take advantage of diagnostics at all levels of the healthcare system now, and now bring those assays to fight AMR. So I think funding is important. People in the space is good, but capitalizing on advances, particularly in the light of COVID, I think is critical. Thank you, thank you, Valeria, for uh, for there. Sorry, thank you, Erin, for pointing that out with the diagnostics. I think it's it's very essential to understand that just the drugs are not going to help us if we don't know what we're actually trying to to treat. Because the idea is that we have a therapy that is as targeted as possible. So you need to know the target, right? Thank you. I'm giving it over to Monica. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll maybe just make allusion to um, something that um, uh, Erin mentioned, which is um, the people part. I, I totally agreed with what you said. I, I do uh, and am a strong believer that ultimately it's people that will change and shift the needle. And I think we are lucky that we are now in a in a in a way of building an ecosystem that's happening at country level as well as at a global level. It's happening both in public and private sector and nonprofit. I think it's imperative that, you know, we have people that will, you know, as as Marcel Tanner used to say, you know, no roots, no fruit. And it it's it's very true. We need people to stay in this game long term. Uh, and I think this is what is going to be a driver of success. Now that is that I, I'm I'm saying that, but we have to also remember that people stay for reasons. Uh, and that's where the link with financing is important. One of the things that worries me a lot about the private sector, particularly the SMEs, is the fragility. And, and you see this turnover of people coming and going. And for us, you know, as an organization, it can be very frustrating to see this, this change because we are relying on a partnership model. Uh, so I think that's an, it's a dimension that's very important. It's similarly, I, I can also say the same thing about academia and, and the clinical networks that we work with, that it's imperative that we maintain this long-term commitment and work from the groups that we're, we're working with. Having said that, I think if they are people that are committed long-term, um, that can deliver. I think we also need leadership as well, and that is related to, to people. I'll, I'll actually just you know turn to, to Martin and say that J&J's 
a, a lot of what J and J achieved was because there was someone at the top, which was Paul Stoffels, who was driving this for almost a generation of 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 work. And you can see that that can really shift the needle in a company. And you know, I hope that that will be continued. But it's a good sign that I think so much has been built. And I think that it, it's it's a commitment that's required over time. You know, I can remember some time ago when Badakulin was was registered in the FDA with that black box warning or whatever it was. But I think with a lot of work and perseverance, you see now where it's it's gradually taking a role in the treatment of patients around the world. But that requires people, leadership and, and perseverance. I don't mention that lightly because we need to be cognizant of the huge challenges we're going to be facing. And I'll, I'll close by giving one example. When we signed our agreement with, with um, Shinogi on an access partnership on Kefidericol, which is a drug that's on the EML of WHO, one of the comments that, that was raised by, by various stakeholders was, you know, well, why are you doing this? This is very difficult. It's extremely challenging. Why would you choose this drug, et cetera, et cetera? Well, the answer is very simple. It's on the essential medicines list. If we can't bring it to patients, why is it on the essential medicines list? Why do we bother? Uh, and, and the reality is we have to be willing now to take on these really big challenges if we are going to succeed. And I believe challenges comes through um, not just initiatives, but also individual pro, um, projects, individual in treatments. We have to show that we can succeed at the ground level and bring something tangible of value to people and populations and, and patients. Thank you. Martin, we are aware you're not speaking for the whole industry, but maybe you still want to take that on. Uh, not well. I speak for J and J, and hopefully it, it's it's broadly accepted. So, firstly, I I think leadership is really important. Paul was my boss for twelve years, so uh, I was very fortunate to have it. And he's an ID specialist, so a, a confluence of effects, a fantastic vision, leadership, and understanding of a problem and prescience, and uh, that led to I think uh, he created our unit as well as pushed us through. I also talk about political leadership and and. As with anything and any initiative, if you have leadership from the very top, continually pushing an issue, um, it always continues to have oxygen. And we've all been involved in initiatives and consortia, right? The die, I call it a consortia roadkill, right? When, when, the, when the leaders of each of the people suddenly nominate people two levels below and another level below to take it on and they move on. And, but what I'm really encouraged about with, with AMR is political leadership has been strong, particularly from Germany, which I think has been remarkable um, uh, in terms of, of maintaining the momentum of this as a true health security issue. And I just want to thank the government of Germany for that, because I think it's really uh, showed fantastic uh, leadership for the world and also for our industry. One other thing, um, the reason I want to talk a little bit about market incentives, because we need to have the fund and we need to actually provide a few billion here, a few billion there to generate R&D in phase three. But that is not going to be anything like the kind of investment you will get if uh, entrepreneurs and startups decide to enter ID, ID, infectious diseases, and invest in that area, just like they have done in ecology. And that needs some kind of incentive on, on what is currently a dormant market or antibiotics are hugely undervalued. Now, what that is, is open to debate. And I think we should all have an open debate about that. But that incentive, given the lag, needs to be thought about now for people to invest now in early stage for the products to come in 10 years time. It's not something we can wait for. So I also just wanna add that. And, and I don't want it to sound self-serving for industry. I honestly believe if we can get antibiotic uh, therapy areas really vibrant again inside startups, biotechs, and large pharma, it's one of our best chance to raise all boats on, on uh, antibiotic technology and, and development. So I'll just add that. Thank you, Martin. Um, Valeria, you're in a very good position because everyone mentioned your research and priority list. And like, it seems to really be the guiding element. So that that work uh, was worth it. Uh, congratulations to your team. Uh, from WHO perspective, what do you see still like the challenges? What are the, yeah, what are the most challenging issues that we still have to overcome? So we have already heard about the challenges, what is missing uh, by this fantastic panel. And it's really good to hear that there is like so much alignment against what still needs to be achieved. And this shows us that we are in the good direction, the good path to try to address this, uh, this issue that is in front of us. And again, 
we need to announce vaccination, vaccination strategy to reduce the use of antibiotics that are the main drivers of AMR. We need to have diagnostics at the core of our strategies with therapeutics and vaccine. We need the patients at the center of our thoughts, at the center of our action, a co-design with them possible solution to address AMR. The teams of access, uh, we need to have global, equitable access and affordable price. 5.7 million people die worldwide due to lack of access. And access is still fragmented and even, and we have a paradox. So where the burden is highest, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan High, the access is the lowest. We need also to streamline uptakes of drugs in countries. When a new product is authorized, you know very well by stringent authorities, now the so-called WHO listed authorities, you still need to have registration in countries where commercialization is sought. So I think that we should streamline effort, promote an optimal use of resources in countries to also reduce the time for patients to access to these new, new drugs. So the pipeline is dry and the time for act is now. This is the main message. Thank you, Valeria. I think that's really important to underline that, right? It's like really the bringing the drugs to the market is the first step, but bringing the drugs to the patient is the goal that we are working for. Um, political leadership uh, has been mentioned, so maybe it's time to also get the politicians involved a bit more. And for that, I am giving it over to Manika, who's already smiling. So over to you. Um. Thank you very much. I think this, we're coming to the last part of this um, session. Um, so I, we'd just like to um, actually just call on a, on a few people to come up and say a few words. Um, as the executive director of GARPI, I would just also like to um, thank all the people who will be coming up for their support to our organization. I think that has been absolutely tremendous and absolutely critical for our work. But as, as Ralph mentioned, you know, we are living in a very interconnected system and, and we are you know, cheering very, very strongly when our, our counterparts are also, uh, I think, you know, strengthened. So particularly, I think, with the creation of the AMR Action Fund, uh, and I think also the and renewed support to CARBEX, actually, that was, was announced recently. Um, so I would first of all like to call um, Veronica, uh, if you could just come up to the lectern and just say a few words. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's it's my distinct pleasure to be here today, and um, I think uh, there's not much more to say to or to add to what you all have said. I, what went through my head when I heard the numbers was that uh, Sunday I was at a cancer session, and um, the argument was uh, it was pointed out that about 10 million of us die each year from cancer, and so here we hear it's about 1.7 probably soon 2 million of us who die from um, resistant bacterial infections. And when I hear, oh, we are expecting an exponential rise, I guess my high school math is sufficient to figure out that this is like the first step of this exponential curve where AMR death will be right up to to cancer death. And then I guess as this goes on, we will really see what has been called the silent epidemic to turn not quite as silent anymore. Because I think one thing we learned during COVID, I still recall this very vividly, is in the very beginning, uh, the scientists would tell us that, oh, this is an exponential infection. But I did not know anybody who had had COVID or who was infected and neither did the people that I knew. And so we were thinking, so the individual experience, my life experience every day and what we were told, it kind of didn't match up. And I think MR is a bit at the same situation. If we think about people, do we know somebody who has had cancer? Most of us will silently or not so silently not, right? Do we know somebody who has had an AMR and resistant uh, bacterial infection? We might actually not even know about it. I would have to say for myself, I'm actually not sure if I do. So this will likely change in the next uh, coming years. And this is what, what, what you all are telling us. And so 
I think um, coming to the point, this uh, is something that uh, the German government has accepted and realized for quite a while. And, and this is at the root of our continued investment in the different aspects of this um, value chain. So you've heard of, of Guard P, you've heard of Crab X, you've heard of the Global AMR Action Fund and of many other initiatives who that have, uh, have been uh, started in, the re in recent years, because I think Germany is by no means alone. Uh, it, it, we come back to the saying that global problems need global solutions. And, and not just that we as an individual country actually have a huge, uh, much higher return on investment if we, if, if we join forces and, and address this, but also um, global solutions in a sense of we have to collaborate, we have to pool our resources along the value chain. And I, I, I think this was very obvious today that this is actually happening at AMR. So it's a role model for other areas because there will never be enough money to afford not knowing about each other. And that is not only true for antibiotics development. It's maybe very, very obvious here because of the unique market situation. But this applies to anything. There's so much we do not know. There's so much we still have to figure out and have to develop to, to deliver on our promise or on our, not promise, on our vision that we would like for everyone to have the health care they need to lead a long and healthy life. And um, I know a vision is something that you look at and aim for. It's not what you think you will achieve very soon, but the steps that are taken here and we take elsewhere, they, sh they all are little steps towards this goal. And so I'm very, very happy and a little bit proud that we will be able as Germany to continue the support for Guard P with 50 million euro for the next five years. And And I, I know you're delivering and I expect great things of you. I'm hoping for great things. <laughs> and uh, we will do what we can to, to do our part. So thank you. <laughs> um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Veronica. And I think I, I can say this on behalf of the panel that um, Germany's leadership here is really strongly appreciated by everyone who's working uh, in this area. You've been a, a tremendous support, and Germany's been a tremendous support, I think, for all the work that we're doing. Um, so, you know, thank you. Uh, you know, from 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 my side, you know, it's it's a real pleasure to work with. Uh, I think with a funder that is so committed long term and has a long term vision uh, of what they want to achieve. So, I'll I just like to call. I'm not sure. If Jeremy Farrar is in the room, but Jeremy, if you could just come up and say a few words, that would be highly appreciated. Hi, I'm Jeremy Farrar from Welcome, um, and it's a great pleasure to join you. Um, it's also a great pleasure to follow on from uh, Veronica. Um, Politicians decide, although sometimes in my own country, that's not always a good idea, but um, we, we should never underestimate the critical importance of having scientific advice within the center of government, um, uh, because politicians need to have options and they need to know those options are well informed uh, and have the background in science. And um, when Veronica says that the scientists told us people un shouldn't take away the impression Veronica herself was a world leading scientist um, and it's critical. And I'll perhaps one of the most important things I'm going to say is, is as a community, we, we do need to stop talking to ourselves and talking to the issue and describing it and realize we live in an ecosystem of competing interests and we need to get out beyond ourselves. Uh, we need to really support those who are brave enough to go into the political arena from the scientific background, um, because without those voices into the political system, we won't get the pressure that we need in order to bring about the change that we all believe to be the right ones. 
And I think that means that we have to get involved in the political system and we have to get involved outside and beyond the echo chamber of ourselves. That means persuading, as we heard earlier, for patient voices so that Veronica's friends and family also will tell her I've got a drug resistant infection. Uh, and I think being streetwise in that about how the world works is critically important. Um, antimicrobial resistant, drug resistant infections bring together similar things as did indeed COVID. Science is absolutely critical, as we've heard from the panel, but politics is critical. Understanding the context of the economic and financial world is absolutely critical. And as Manika said, putting equity at the heart of what we do. And that's why Welcome is very pleased to be able to continue to support Guard P, I think since 2018, as well as the AMR Fund and the AMR Hub and CarbEx. Um, because I think we need an ecosystem that doesn't just do the science, that's our traditional territory, but also pushes the politics, uh, pushes the public engagement and involvement with what is happening in schools, in communities, uh, in hospitals and in clinics, but also critically appreciates that while stewardship is absolutely critical, so is access. Because you die if you don't get access to an antibiotic or antiviral or anti-DTB. I'm very pleased to see that brought into the equation. Um, and whilst stewardship is critical, so is access. And that's where Secure comes in. And that's why we're so pleased to be able to support Secure uh, over the coming years. And I hope in, into the very long term, because this is a long term issue. So I think we are announcing 1.2 million something. But world's currencies are all about the same at the moment. Uh, 1.2 million uh, Swiss francs or euros. Um, I wouldn't suggest you take the pounds, but you can have you can have whichever of those you wish. Um, but thank you very, very much indeed and absolute support. And uh, we are also delighted and very, you should feel very proud of Germany's contribution to the AMR space as well as so much else in global health. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Actually, it's very appreciated. Uh, and uh, again, you know, I'd say the Wellcome Trust has been really a key pillar in this space. Um, and as Jeremy um, uh, very nicely pointed out, I think e everyone on this table somehow is, is I think, grateful for uh, really the foundational support that the Wellcome Trust has provided. Um, um, last but not least, I'd like to call on Joel Denny, who works for the Public Health Agency in Canada. So Joel, please come up and share a few few words. Thank you. Um, my name is Joël Denis. I'm the Director General of the AMR Task Force at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and I think it's fitting that um, we're able to speak about this at the panel today because you've highlighted a lot of some of the similar issues that we're, we're coming together to resolve. Um, we think that SECURE through GARPI's, um, uh, GARPI's SECURE initiatives mission is extremely critical. You've heard some of the, the headlines that we hear a lot about when we think about AMR, the, the death toll, the economic burden. Um, some of the, the data, though, that you don't hear a lot about, and Manika, I noticed it's on your fact sheet that's on everybody's chairs. It's on page two in a much smaller font than the uh, facts on page one, uh, around the one, um, one out of five deaths of children under five and the three million deaths um, uh, from sepsis. And so the, the focus from the, uh, the LMIC and the equity angle that SECURE provides, we think is, is extremely important. Many of us, uh, myself included, have the fortune of living in countries where healthcare works fairly well and where access to antibiotics is a no-brainer. And in fact, to the point where we take it for granted, uh, but not everybody does. And certainly in uh, low and middle income countries, we see this as a, as a huge challenge and so secures uh, mission in, in addressing that and bringing uh, these important life-saving medicines to those that are most in need, we think is um, most valiant and worthy of um, and worthy of support. And the hard lessons from COVID nineteen have shown us that uh, global readiness and collaboration and partnership um, is what's required to address some of these um, these great health threats like COVID. And for those of you that are not as familiar with AMR but are in more in the global health space, I hope that one of your takeaways from this is the similarities that uh, facing um, that we face in AMR in facing challenges like COVID. And so when you think of some of the structures and funding mechanisms and partnerships that are being developed um, more broadly for global health. We hope you'll remember AMR uh, as an example of things that, that um, will follow the same lines, but often perhaps doesn't get as much attention. And so um, with that, we're very pleased to, to join our international partners in the, the announcement and commit to provide an initial contribution of uh, $300,000 uh, this year to secure. 
um, for its important work in addressing AMR, a more modest um, contribution than some of the others, but we think an important one, and we hope important one as a signal of another G7 country that is getting involved in the, the global fight for AMR and particularly secures um, mandate and initiative. We also recognize, as some have pointed out, and Martin, you've addressed it as well, the, the importance on the market failures overall and the um, and the, the pull incentives. This is an area that Canada is, is doing much more work since the inception of our task force over the, over the last 10 months. We, in fact, have right now an independent panel that's looking at just that, how to, um, how to implement a pull incentive in Canada. Um, and so we see the, the, the approach with SECURE is, is not only about the global agenda, although that's important in and of itself, but um, the lessons we'll learn by partnering with you in SECURE about looking at the pooled demand, the, the pooled procurement, the, um, the pooled valuation that's required, I think will be things that we will learn from it. And I think other countries would learn as well. And so um, we would encourage others to also think about uh, joining us and the, the international partners. And I would just like to thank uh, all of you for the contribution that you make uh, in this space and a big congratulations to Germany and uh, international partners that are also making commitments. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, if it's okay, Laura, I'll just say a few words about Secure uh, before I hand back to to our chair. Um, so, just to, for for those of you who who aren't aware, Secure is a is a, I would say one of our um, uh, partnership projects or initiatives that we are working with WHO and other partners, where we're really looking to see how we can look at models of access, um, both for new uh, antibiotics as well as some um, old uh, older reserve antibiotics that we feel could be better used. Uh, into against uh, antimicrobial resistance, and there are a few components that are being developed. One, as Shoa mentioned, is is around procurement, uh, and linked to that, we we also need to be looking at at payment models. Um, the other is around manufacturing supply. Um, there's another component around um, registration uh, and more kind of regu the regulatory dimension. Uh, and last but not least, we're also having a component around ev evidence generation guidance. Uh, and use, uh, which will, which is of course very closely linked with um, stewardship. Um, so we're trying to build these different pieces with a range of different partners and a range of different countries, and we're trying to uh, work at country level to look at a few kind of initial adopter countries who would be willing to pilot this um, with us. And of course, what we are also trying to do is to look at actual projects. So uh, for instance, I mentioned um, a, a partnership that we signed recently, and this is the kind of project that we would look at as a, as a pilot project within Secure and of course populate Secure with, with such projects going forward. Um, I think I, I would say that there's there's probably not much original in this project, and I'm not saying that as to downplaying it, I'm saying it to kind of upplay it. We're looking and learning from everything that's been done in the global health space uh, over the last um, 20, 30 years. And really then I think crafting it uh, and adapting it to, to the area that we're working on, but also trying to now pull in and look at partners that have been that are actually in the global health architecture, uh, as well as also looking at what's happening uh, at country level. So there's a lot I think that has already been done. Uh, for instance, you know, just to give an example, of what's been done in the TB space um, that I think we can learn uh, a lot from and apply in this area. Um, I'll finish by by basically saying, you know, from from my perspective as a clinician who's worked in many different countries around the world before, uh, you know, ending up in this job. Um, I think for me that the the key it it is it comes down to the key indicator of success. What do we really define uh, as success? I I strongly believe that we do need to look at things like incentives and payment models. We do need to look at procurement. We do need to look at regulatory pathways. All of these aspects are key, but they all our means to an end. Uh, and at the end of the day, what we really want to see is the fact that we have um, treatments that are highly effective and are used appropriately and that can really uh, change the needle in how we deliver um, healthcare and public health around the world. I, I will reiterate by saying antimicrobials are one of those very, very few things in, in modern medicine that has really made a big impact on life expectancy. It's it's clear and there's there's a, there's a lot of data behind that. But more importantly, as someone who's worked in, a, in high income countries, low, in, low middle income countries, antibiotics form the backbone of healthcare. I just cannot remember never not using antimicrobials in healthcare. And it's not whether we've known a patient who's had AMR, although I've known quite a few or even uh, people in my, my family network. 
but actually it's more that who here hasn't had an antibiotic some at some point in their life that that's the real question and that's why we really need to look after and treasure this 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 really wonderful uh, i think innovation that society has been gifted with but something that we can't take for granted thank you Thank you, Manika. Um, yeah, I, I think we have said money is not the only most important thing, but it's definitely uh, important to keep things running. Uh, we have also said people are a really uh, important part of it. So I would now like to turn to the people in this room um, and see if there is any questions or comments for the panelists uh, on here, because certainly if one thing became clear in the discussions today is that we really need all of the community to get involved and to bring up their ideas and contributions to, uh, to the table. I see uh, two hands already, so maybe we start uh, in the back and after two questions, give it back to the panelists and then we see if we have more time. Thank you, I'm Cecilia Ferreira from FINE. Um, it has been an amazing panel and a very optimist message during the morning, but diagnostics, 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 and I can keep saying diagnostic. Has, we cannot go blind, and especially in the LMICs, the Biomerieu, the CFID are very expensive and not at all feasible to use in an LMIC. We just need a landscape that is going to be published uh, by the end of the year. There is not a single tool that can be used in a district hospital in Africa. Without diagnostics, we are blind. Uh, so I understand the high income countries perspective that we need more antibiotics. But what you need in LMIC is you're not sure what kind of antibiotics you know, because even data is not there. So the Lancet Commission report from the last year showed that only a third of the LMIC population had access to diagnostics. How are we thinking about bringing access to antibiotics to people in LMICs without access to diagnostics? The same for vaccines. And I know that Carvex is really pushing through the three pillars, but we have to put at the same level diagnostics, vaccines, and antibiotics. Thank you very much. Can we take one other question? Before? Yes, hi. Uh, good morning. I'm Nina from Four Paws Animal Welfare. Thank you for all your efforts. Uh, when we talk about upstream, uh, tackling the problem upstream, and we heard conversations about the need to leave silos, 70% of antibiotics are used in livestock annually. And this is a big part of the problem. We're driving antimicrobial resistance through our food systems, how important do you believe the role of so bringing in the agriculture industry to tackle these problems would be? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Valeria, maybe I give it to you. Um, the priority list worked so well for the for the drugs. Is there one coming for diagnostics? So I think that I, yes, I addressed this point in, uh, in my initial uh, talks that actually we need all these three pillars. We cannot do we can address AMR only with diagnostics if we don't have access to therapeutics. We need vaccines to reduce the use no, of, antibi of antibiotics that are the main driver of AMR. So all these components, again, diagnostics, vaccine, therapeutics, should be at the core of our healthcare strategy. We cannot rely on one of these components alone. So it's really important, again, the power of partnership, of pulling together the different expertise to ensure a consistent deliver of this three, three global health goods that should be packaged together, also from a public health perspective. It's really important that we keep them uh, together. And I think that you want also me to address the second point about the uh, about one health. And actually, um, yes, agree. We should do everything in AMR under the one health perspective. Um, you mentioned um, stewardship. We, we are addressing stewardship from an integrated perspective, as well as surveillance. We cannot work in silos in the human, animal, and environmental food production space without communicating and without acting together, exchanging data across the different sectors and developing programs and activities in an integrated and coherent manner. So this is also uh, what the WHO is trying to, to address. Thank you. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, you're totally right. We haven't addressed like the, the animal health sector very much in this session. Um, however, there is going to be a second session following right after this, actually in this same room where it's uh, where AMR is going to be the topic again. It's a bit more on um, the burden of disease and surveillance and what uh, public health institutes can contribute. And I'm thinking that there they're going to go uh, very much more into depth uh, with that um, topic as well. Um, but uh, maybe coming back to the to the diagnostics, I mean, it's something, and I, I think Manika knows that as well. Like, if you if you work in a country, especially sub-Saharan Africa, I'm um, doing a lot of work in in Uganda, and I have excellent colleagues there that have um, incredible clinical experience, but they have no access to diagnostics. So it's really treating patients like in the darkness, right? You don't know what um, what to expect, and you have to use basically always broad spectrum antibiotics because um, that's your only opportunity. So there, that's a really big issue um, that I'm sure you have experienced and that GARP is also trying to tackle. Yeah, um, Cecilia, thanks for the um, comment. I fully agree, of course. Uh, I, I think that it's a big challenge in the different programmatic areas we're working in, in GARP. Sometimes we recognize that there are challenges. Um, for instance, in our neonatal sepsis program, we've been forced to move towards a direction of looking at alternative empiric treatments to the current WHO first line recommended treatment. And that's why for that program, we've really looked at combining, uh, looking at combinations of existing reserve generic antibiotics as an answer to the problem rather than accelerating towards you know new antibiotics. And for the SCI program where we are developing, and we have a, a partnership with WHO and FIND on this, we are trying to, in parallel, um, you know, look at the diagnostic component when we look at their new drug introduction. I think this will still be, be a challenge. Have, having said all of that, and, and I, I totally agree with what Laura has said, that the reality in, in a lot of settings is that you have to do what you can but you know, it doesn't. It, for me, it doesn't mean that you can't necessarily have access to the antimicrobials you need if you know that in your setting, based on the surveillance data you have, you already have a high background of resistance. I think then not allowing access uh, is 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 also problematic. So the challenge is, we have to see how we will look at the use and the sequence of use of different antimicrobials in this setting while we're trying to upgrade diagnostic capacity. Which brings me to a third point which is really about the health system infrastructure and health system strengthening, which is something we haven't really talked about today, but it's the under underlying issue, I think, here, because I've always seen antimicrobials as just part of the health system infrastructure. And when that part is weak, we have to look at how we fill that, that, that. but we have to look at, look at it in the context of the wider health system. So certainly if you are dropping in new antimicrobials or if you're dropping in new diagnostics, you have to think about how this fits into the healthcare infrastructure and not the other way around, not how the healthcare infrastructure fits to your innovation. And I think this is the biggest challenge I've seen in global health repeatedly, not just in, in this area, but, but in other areas. So I think on the diagnostic side, and, and I know that in FIND you, you are obviously thinking about this a lot, um, we do have to have a lot of discussions at country level at, with different levels of healthcare settings on saying what is the level of diagnostic capacity is realistic to achieve in the coming years, particularly in those high burden countries where we are starting to get an idea based on some of the surveillance data in recent publications. We, we need to, we, we can't be everywhere all the time, but we can start looking at, at specific high burden settings and look at the kind of diagnostic capacity that really should be in place uh fitting in i think more to the to the uh, i think broader healthcare system in there and I, i'd say this partly because we don't have national you know we we have not na national action plans but often we in most countries you're not having national uh, programs per se uh that are well funded this you, you saw this in hiv and tb and it's not a coincidence that you you saw being put in place you know, the, the kind of integrated approach with diagnostics and treatments and preventative measures. You have that when you have well-funded national control programs. And that that is the problem we have also with AMR. Thank you. Yeah. I... yeah. 
One thing we can we see in our dashboard is really that diagnostic is really underfunded and that we is, is a thing we would like to tackle even more and so I have sh chosen as one of the priorities for for the for the hub. Uh, so it's only one third uh, of the funding is going to diagnostic compared to uh, therapeutics, for example. And uh, for livestock, um, the the use in livestock of uh, antibiotics. So uh, we from the hub are really uh, have a one health lens really from from the beginning. So we had the board meeting last week. We had invited the world uh, organization of farmers, uh, not farmer, but farmers. Um, so. Um, and there will be a, a, a conference next month in Oman, this uh, third high-level ministerial conference um, on AMR, and there will be an announcement uh, that uh, the, the, and, uh, the re reduce the need that, that antibiotics in uh, livestock should be reduced by 30 to 50 percent until 2030. This is an announcement will be made, made, and that's uh, CIA, so critical important antimicrobials for human medicine. Uh, that there will uh, supposed to be zero use in uh, in, in animals without a veterinary aspect. So it's, uh, you will hear, hear a lot more uh, at, the, at the end of this year. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two more short questions. I saw more hands, I think, or maybe we reply to everyone. No, there is one. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian Schöner from University Hospital Leipzig. Um, thanks for the great panel. Uh, yeah, maybe we saw a lot of uh, money being pledged. That's fantastic, uh, going to great organizations. And you've talked a lot about access to the antibiotics you're developing. Uh, and I'm just wondering, are there any concrete measures you're taking, any strings attached to that money that actually assure that it reaches the patients in need? Uh, and then you've talked about stewardship as well, but like, are there any string? Are there any assurances for that as well? Because oftentimes, you know, um, access antibiotics like on the WHO access list aren't even accessible. So how do we make sure that um, if you succeed and make your antibiotic accessible, how do we make sure that this isn't used if um, another one could be, you know, uh, could be used first? Thank you. I, I think Monica and then maybe Martin. I kind of want to address the second part of your question about stewardship and the last question, because I'm wondering, you may already be covering this, but there's a massive opportunity with, with the fifth coming up from pandemic preparedness for funds available for healthcare system strengthening. Do we think about a horizontal approach where, you know, we're training healthcare workers and there's, there's probably quite a lot of money that's available now and will be available <clears throat> in trying to strengthen healthcare systems around pandemic preparedness and readiness, that should actually be made available to strengthening healthcare systems for everyday healthcare in the front line. And are we thinking about training those healthcare workers in stewardship, in uh, investing in diagnostics that could apply to emerging pathogens as well as existing pathogens? And of course, we have the increased uh, investment in pathogen surveillance, uh, which will of course significantly help us in terms of understanding geographic patterns of resistance. Uh, within different drug classes. So I'm wondering if AMR is involved uh, to a significant discussion in these funds and in, in the way these funds are being used, because uh, well, the worst thing that could happen was we we invest a lot in preparing for the next pandemic and these resources are not being used appropriately for everyday healthcare uses in the last mile. And I think there might be an opportunity to, to build at least awareness and training in, in frontline healthcare worker training and development. Uh, we, for one, are investing in a catalytic fund under the Global Fund, 200,000 new healthcare workers to be trained and paid as professional healthcare workers. Are we thinking that way, Monica? I'm wondering. Um, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And I think this is why I think it's very important we have AMR in the kind of pandemic discussion um, as well. I'll, I'll let Erin um, comment on uh, in a minute because I know she has worked um, in Carbex and we, we've been involved um, with Carbex on this, but working on their stewardship access plans. Um, well, I can maybe just comment for Guard P. I, I think you raise a, a very fundamental point, actually, um, and it's my it's been my kind of lifelong belief, if we can put it that way, that um, public money needs to have a public return um, wherever it's being spent. It's public money, and we are largely a public funded organization. We we are more than 98% of our financing is coming from, from governments. 
And it's exactly why, for instance, we've set up this secure uh, initiative um, that that yeah, you know both Work and Trust and, and Canada are are actually um, financing and supporting. But it's also why in, in the agreements we make with companies, we we actually can spend quite a long time having these negotiations because we don't we don't provide grants to companies. We develop partnerships and agreements. And we have actually learned quite a lot on how, you know, big companies make comp partnerships with small companies when they inject a lot of cash into a, into a small company. Essentially, you know, we are bringing in a lot of um, financial, human and other resources into a partnership. And that has to come with a form of a trade. Uh, and so we make some very clear asks in our agreements and, and it can range from a, a, a variety of different things. For example, that the drug is only developed for certain indications and not for others, which we don't think there's any public health benefit. Um, that there there is a lot there are terms in terms of licensing. If there's not a clear access plan for the company, that the company actually gives us a license. Uh, and you you will see in our website that we've we've three such partnerships already with different companies. Um, we may also look at um, the, asking the company to look at doing re additional research on certain indications that may not be commercially attractive, but are very important for public health needs, including in the pediatric area, as an example. We may also look at making requests on timing of registration, uh, including uh, supporting registration that may lead to, for instance, a WHO collaborative regulatory process. So for instance, there, usually we would require EMA registration much further in advance than a company would would advance. Actually, Germany as a funder has specifically asked us to ensure that, you know, as an as using German money, that that we look at registration even in in the EU as a as a prerequisite. So that's something we put in. We look at the timing or when these commitments are happening. So these are all different things that we have tried to put in place. There's, there's a whole raft of other things, specifically around stewardship and environmental use and so on. It, very difficult to know how much we will be able to enforce certain things, but other things we can, for instance, on the licensing part. And that gives us much more freedom to then operate subsequently, including then in how we partner with, for instance, generic companies down the line who may be manufacturers uh, of, of you know, the products that are being currently uh, being developed. So we, we try to give a taste on that. It's It's a very complex business and it can be a very cumbersome business and it can be sometimes very frustrating and slow but we've also walked away from a lot of potential agreements because we just haven't been able to find the right fit in the partnership and that's okay actually i guess i'll just comment i mentioned it in my opening remarks but at, at carbex we do require every product developer that comes into the portfolio um, to ultimately have a stewardship and access plan. Now, things don't get real until um, you know, you're in advanced development, so phase three. Um, and this is a, a guide that we worked uh, together with our funders, uh, as well as GuardP and other organizations, um, so that you know companies would understand how to do this, when to do this, and why to do this. But I should also say that earlier in development, and in part because we are funded by the UK government through GAMRIF, um, we do encourage our product developers to think from the outset about indications where um, you know, it might not be so commercially attractive. Think about manufacturing, how you might do that in country, when you might do that, um, what you know, in country regulatory studies you might want to do. And so we try to encourage them, you know, early in development so you don't get to that phase three stage and then say, oh wow, uh, I have to think about access. So, you know, we're doing it supportively, but then ultimately we do require this plan. Thank you. And and maybe just to add also on the healthcare worker side and on and on the training, WHO actually has a range of very good resources and training courses on AMR surveillance, on AMR, on antimicrobial use, uh, and so on for all kind of settings. So I think there we are like very well prepared on, on that side. Um we are unfortunately already at the end of uh at this session, um, I I think what we can really take away is that in the AMR research and development sector, we have a very advanced ecosystem with a lot of cooperation already. 
um, but it's also still fragile. It's not very old. It's still growing and it's still trying to find uh, its way. We need the funding, but we mainly need to use the funding smartly uh, and in the right ways. Um, and we need to put the patient and the access components at the center of all of our activities because that's uh, our final goal is really bringing the drugs to uh, um, to our patients. And um, I think we've seen a lot of leadership and we've seen a lot of commitment in this session and that's probably what makes us all hopeful. Um, even so, uh, I take away for myself, I still have to be a bit uh, patient for the for the new drugs. <laughs>